Welcome to Cabin Fever. I'm Jake Barry. Today, it's the first time I've done this this year. Uh, well, period. I haven't done this in, in a very long time. I've got Daniel Stevens from from Channel Four News. He's he's come on. He's been gracious enough. We're going to talk sports, where he's from, basically everything. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Jake. I'm looking forward to it. You know, you're you're a Valley native. A lot of people think when you know you get news people that come in that they're going to be from out of town. But you're you're home. You're homegrown. Yeah, I kind of throw people for a loop. I don't, I don't really fit the Valley mold. I don't look like I'm from the Valley. So, so just to clear the air, my dad is from the Valley. He grew up in Matamoros slash Brownsville. And my mom's from Columbus, Ohio. So that's where the, the height and the fair skin comes from. Um, so that, that kind of throws people for a loop. But I was born and raised in Brownsville. Grew up my entire life in Brownsville up until I went to college and, and just got lucky enough to come right back after school. So, so it's been great. The Valley's been home for a long time. And you went to school at, at one of the powerhouses for journalism, which was Missouri. Uh, you know, um, that had to be a trip to go all the way up there. Oh, absolutely. And I knew I wanted some kind of a different experience. Um, I had looked at schools here in state, but, but given that my mom was from Ohio, I was actually looking at Ohio University, despite the fact that I actually grew up an Ohio State fan. Um, so Ohio University in Athens was a great journalism program that I actually visited. Uh, wasn't a great fit for me. Uh, University of Texas was a great option. SMU, where my dad had been to school, was a great option as well. But it came down to a Google search. Uh, people think it's some elaborate decision that I made. No, I really just Googled journalism schools, and University of Missouri came up in every search. So I didn't think Northwestern academically was going to be something I could get into. And when I visited Mizzou, it just seemed like the right fit. So um, it, was a, it was a step in, in a different direction, but it ended up being one of the greatest decisions I've made for sure. I, and I had a chance, I was reading your bio, and, and you not, I noticed that you put on there that, you know, you've always wanted to cover sports. What, where, where did that come from? And, and I guess, who did you grow up watching? Well, growing up, it really was just kind of a combination of a couple things. So my sister was really into music theater. And yeah, I was an athlete. I played, you know, as many sports as I could possibly play. And so slowly but surely, because my sister was so involved in music theater, my mom was like, hey, you should really get involved in this. Help her out. You know, you can be one of her campers or whatever here at the Camille Playhouse in Brownsville. And I started doing that. I realized that I was loud. I loved to talk and I was comfortable in front of people. So what was my best way to combine these two? And at that time, I was thinking that weather would have been something I would have loved to have done because I could just talk and just be comfortable, be a storm chaser, do all the cool things you see on TV. But then I realized that the best combination would be just to bring sports and my love for being in front of people, communicating, talking. Um, together and that was sports broadcast so back in high school a friend of mine and I started a tv show for for homecoming class and uh, it ended up being a lot of fun and that sparked the interest and sure enough ended up going to Mizzou and here I am now oh wow and, and you know you're at a hotbed for, because channel four um, has been a hotbed as far as uh, their sports reporters making it to the next level Darren Hayes Brendan uh, Fitzgerald they they went on to ESPN MMA um, and uh, WUSA what, what, are, what are your plans for the future? Well, my, I mean, I'm always trying to grow. And in an industry like this, there, there are really a lot of options you can go. And I think this is something that a lot of people kind of lose sight of is they get lost in the fact that journalists are very one dimensional. And once you're in this kind of field, you're kind of restricted to what people say is low pay and limited options moving around a lot. But in reality, writing and communication is the foundation of any business. So for me, I obviously would love to stay in the broadcast route, but I have friends all across the country who have gone from a journalism degree to great PR and advertising jobs or great strategic communications jobs with universities and businesses. I have one friend who's working for a tech company right now making great money and she writes blog posts for them. So the skills that you get from journalism can translate everywhere. But for me right now, at the very least, uh, I'm planning on just trying to continue to grow. Um, continue to tell stories and, and be a fixture in the community and, and really just enjoy it. I've never really taken myself too seriously. So right now I'm having a great time. We're just doing our merger with uh, Channel 23. So we are now one KVEO family. And that's been a huge blessing. We're getting a lot more resources with our new ownership group. And, and there's a lot coming out of Channel 4 and Channel 23 right now that's great. So right now I'm really focused on this and, and focused on my, my hometown. But, uh, but who knows what's next? But it, I'm hoping it's going to be in TV somewhere somewhere bigger, somewhere, you know, where I can continue to grow. And nobody was expecting what, what COVID has done to us. Um, how has it changed the sports landscape for you guys? Because you guys have to find stories, but you can't really go out like you normally do and, and meet with coaches and players. 
Yeah, there's there's no way to to prepare for anything like this. But I think it's important that when something does happen like this, you do reflect first. You don't jump into any one particular thing, and you understand what kind of resources do you do have available. And so, fortunately for us, we do have things like Zoom. Uh, we have our cameras. We have our gear. We have the ability to to do live shows elsewhere or recorded shows. Um, and we have the software that's going to put us in a good position to to be flexible at the very least. So I think Amanda Atwell and I, when everything first started going, we really kind of took a step back. We wanted to be indispensable to the rest of our station. So we wanted to make ourselves available for news. We did a lot of producing and even more web content. But when it came down to, hey, there are whispers, there are things still happening in sports. We had a couple hirings in Donna. We thought, okay, well now it's time to really, really put a schedule together. So we were able to put up some things and it started with Facebook Monday, Wednesday, Friday with our sofa sports special. And then it elevated into a couple of produced shows on Tuesdays and Fridays and then as needed content everywhere sprinkled in between. So the draft was definitely a huge relief for both of us to actually put some great content out and just continue to feel like we're working. Cause I think that's the hardest thing is keeping that routine, but we didn't want to dive into anything. We made a plan and, and I'm really happy with how things have been going as of late. What's been that moment for you covering sports that has uh, stuck with you? That's It's your big moment, your defining moment as far as right now your career. It's early, but what, what's that moment? That's wild. I don't think there's any one particular moment. You know, at first glance when I was in, in college, uh, Mizzou gave us a great opportunity to work with the community and with Mizzou Athletics as well. So the unique thing about Mizzou was instead of working from a classroom, we actually had an NBC affiliate television station that was owned by the university. So I was a working employee for them. So I did a lot of stories and I covered a lot of Mizzou games, both football and basketball and got great experience that way. And I always thought that would be my big moment or covering uh, Pioneer and Bernie Champion in, in an unbelievable third round game over in San Antonio. Um, there was a lot of those moments that I thought, man, this would be a great moment for me. But it actually came down to a lot of the moments that I've had storytelling and in local sports in particular. So uh, my first esports story with Mikey over at Mission Veterans was one I really loved and, and him letting me into his home and, and allowing me to tell his story was awesome. Or covering Brandon Estevez over at Hannah and his weightlifting story uh, was a lot of fun and just really connecting with these people across the valley. Um, that's when that's when those moments really kind of hit home in terms of this is why I really enjoy doing these things is meeting these people and athlete of the week series where I get to compete against athletes has been goofy and and really allows me to just have a good time with these athletes so that's been a huge blessing as well so it's really those intimate moments with the people I'm covering and the people whose stories I'm sharing that have been have been the best part about doing this job. Now I remember a live show and the reason I'm, I'm bringing this story up is my boss, the superintendent from McCallum, we were watching you, and I can't remember who you were throwing to, but it was uh, you were on our stadium there in McCallum Memorial, um, McCallum Veterans Memorial Stadium. And a lot of, I'm just going to point this out because I was in an old um, uh, QB challenge for the media. And I was kind of probably the only one that knew how to throw a football, and no, no offense to the other guys that, that were in the competition, but you were whipping the ball. Before, before one of your live shots, you were whipping it probably about 45, 50 yards to, I'm not sure who it was. It, I think it was one of the anchors. I'm, I'm not sure if it was an anchor or not. Chris Jacobs, CBS4 anchor. Yeah, it was before yeah. one of our CBS4 on the road shows. We always brought a football. I think week two we started doing that because I, I don't want to just sit there and wait for live shots. So we started, I brought a football out uh, that we found in the sports office and we'll just whip it around before before uh, I guess our game time. And uh, You've got chops. You've got chops. You can whip that ball. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to whatever media challenge we can get. But but it's interesting because when I, again, going back to my time at Mizzou, I always I always had this this picture in my head. I don't know if it was ESPN related or seeing a lot of these ex-athletes become reporters, but I was always under the impression that all these reporters were athletes. And, and that's why they were able to talk about these things. But I came to realize I was maybe one of three athletes in my class of the 25 kids that ended up graduating in the sports broadcast program my year. That actually played sports and uh, at first I thought it was an advantage for me I don't think that's the case I think it always comes down to hard work your dedication to the craft and really just investing in the sport or investing in, in your craft in journalism as a whole but um, I've definitely fallen back on on the fact that I do love my experiences with sports I think it gives me a unique perspective at least with the athletes that are playing now, but most of them don't believe it. Like they'll see me throw a football or dribble a basketball and they'll be like, Oh, I didn't expect that. 
um, which is interesting because, uh, you know, growing up, I always had this picture that these, uh, these journalists were athletes. So I guess that's not the, that's not the case with most of these high school athletes, but, but no, I, I definitely love my sports background and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So, so next time you got to join in and throw the football with us. Yeah, well, I'm old, so my bones will break. But, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you this. What's your favorite sport? Because, you know, you cover all the sports. And we're going to get to eSports, too. So if it's eSports, I understand, too, because I'm a big eSports guy. What, what's your favorite sport? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. There's two, difference, uh, two different questions there. So there's my favorite sport to play, and there's my favorite sport to cover, because surprisingly enough, they actually are different. Um, I grew up playing baseball, basketball, football, and I pretended to play golf. Um, because nobody really plays golf and the people that do are just crazy. Um, but basketball was always my favorite sport. It was the one that, you know, I put the most time into and the one that, um, I just enjoy playing the most and probably the one I play the most today, aside from again, pretending to play golf. But in terms of coverage, um, I mean, there's, there's nothing quite like covering high school football here in the Valley. And then I've also grown to love soccer quite a bit. Um, I actually, again, through the University of Missouri, got the opportunity to work out in London for four months. And I was working for a television station there. And, and that's where I kind of started to follow um, the Premier League quite a bit. And I became a huge Tottenham Hotspur fan. Just so unfortunate because they're the Dallas Cowboys of the Premier League. Just get your hopes up only to crush them, uh, which te seems to be a trend with all my sports fandom. But, but soccer has been huge. And fortunately for me, we have some of the best soccer in the state here in the Valley. So soccer has been a lot of fun to cover. And I was, I was pretty heartbroken getting right into playoffs and seeing most, most of these, uh, these leagues get canceled. So that was a bummer for me. So sports um, to cover, definitely all of them, but soccer has definitely jumped up front, right, right up there with, with football and, uh, and then to play definitely basketball, but esports, great point. Something that I've gotten to do quite a bit. Um, something that I'm, I love doing. And during quarantine, what better time to talk about playing video games for hours on end, for sure. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting because you're like the one person I've seen openly go out and find these esports stories because a lot of people, they're still hesitant to touch them, but you have embraced it. You've, you've wanted to cover them, and I think that's the coolest thing. Yeah, yeah, we're all products of our experience. Um, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, you keep saying that you're old. Um, I'm not going to share my age or anything like that. I have to put on this mature persona, but uh, I still play a ton of video games with my friends and uh, I've grew up playing a lot of video games. Um, and then we're all products of our experience, like I said. So again, going back to my college years, uh, not even the University of Missouri, but Columbia College, which was a school about two miles down, was actually one of the pioneering universities in esports in the entire country. And they have one of the top esports programs to this day. I believe their League of Legends team is one of the top in the country. Mizzou ended up getting an esports team and became Rocket League national champions two years ago when they first started the program. So I was actually surrounded by the growth of esports um, back in back in college. So I guess I just showed my age there. But um, but when it comes down to esports, we actually had a lot of students and a lot of people who were invested in these programs and who did stories like this. So. My first story with, uh, with eSports down here in the Valley with Mikey at Mission Vets, um, it was actually driven through a connection I had with a friend who was a professional street fighter player here in the Valley. It was actually an old trainer of mine. His brother was the professional street fighter trainer. I got connected with Mikey, made the connection and, and got thrown into this world. And, and it's grown since then. I know McCallan ISD is doing an unbelievable job bringing eSports into the forefront and into the classroom which gives kids who otherwise wouldn't have opportunities an opportunity to play, an opportunity to compete, opportunity to be teammates. And, and that's something that's unique and, and that I'd lo I love covering, to be honest. All right, I gotta stop you right here because I wanna ask you, is that a snowboard in the background? You know, that is, I see. That is, wow. I wish I had a better background for you. I usually bring the giant tiger out behind me, but I figured we'd keep it at least relatively <laughs> professional or at least as professional as you can be in my, my kid's bedroom or my, you know, youth bedroom, my, my childhood bedroom. Um, but yeah, two snowboards in the back, uh, gray ones, my little brothers and the red ones. mine. Wow. You don't see that too often here in the Valley. Somebody that snowboards. No, no. And I, and I do have to give a shout out to you. So a lot of, uh, Valley sports fans should be, or, or otherwise are familiar with Kai money. Uh, he's a close family friend of mine, family friend of mine and his dad, Philip, who's just a wild man. And, and has a great kiteboarding school out in out in uh, at the island. He was actually the one who taught me how to snowboard uh, my freshman year of high school. 
And ever since then, I just, I fell in love with it. It's obviously much different than anything you can get down here, but, uh, but I make a point to at least get, get out there at least once or twice a season to, to go and ride. That's really nice. Where, where's the uh, furthest you've gone to snowboard? Um, so the, the place where I learned was in Utah, a tiny, tiny mountain called Brighton. Um, so a lot of people are familiar with Park City. Well, if you blew a hole through the mountain, uh, it's about a 15 minute drive. But in all reality, during the winter, you have to drive all the way down mm -hmm. and all the way around. So it's about an hour. But yeah, Brighton, a little snowboard town. There's one restaurant, one lodge. Um, super cheap if anybody's ever looking for a budget ride, but some of the best snow. And I think that's the furthest north I've been. I've, I've done some Colorado skiing, and I did did a little mini mountain out in Ohio one time. But uh, but for the most part, it's it's Utah. Oh, it's very cool. It, it, all right, so I want to ask you this: what, Who is the one athlete that you've been able to interview that was that was that was it professional? Let's we'll go professional so we don't go anybody local and offend anybody. I haven't done a lot of big time named interviews. I think. From a professional standpoint, Mark Brunel, I interviewed and really? actually in London. He was doing a Jaguars camp because of the Jaguars initiative with London Sports. And so they were like, all right, who are we sending? And they were like, let's pick the American because he's the only one who knows anything about it. So we get out there and Mark Brunel's there uh, coaching, got to interview him. And, and one of my very, very last questions was, what's your favorite memory playing against the Cowboys naturally? And he said, uh, coming into the second half and roasting them down 14 to come and beat them. And I actually remembered that game, which was just disheartening, but we had a good laugh about it. And so I think from, a, from an interview perspective, off the top of my head, he comes up first. But I have to imagine there was at least one other when I was at Mizzou, but nothing's actually coming to mind. So we'll stick with Mark Brunel for that. I'll let you know if anything else comes to mind. Though. All right. And, and, you know, a lot of uh, people going, you know, coming into the, into the sports, Things to think that they have to have a catchphrase, kind of like Stuart Scott or anything like that. Did you come up with your own catchphrase when you were trying trying to uh, come up with your own identity? Um, not exactly. I think, you know, a lot of people pull things, again, from people they watch. And Tony Rielli is one of my all-time favorite broadcasters. Uh, from strictly a broadcast perspective, from a storytelling perspective, I love the way Marty Smith tells stories. He's just unapologetically him and really gets to the human element. Um, but from strictly a broadcasting standpoint, Tony Reale has always been the foundation of, of who I've wanted to, to model my, my craft after, um, or at least build my own craft based off of his work. And so you can draw direct parallels to the fact that he throws a paper after every around the horn. Um, I actually started doing that in high school, uh, just as a nod to Tony Reale. And so it was kind of a natural instinct at Channel 4 that I was doing a baseball story and I had crumbled the paper. And at the time, I think I was saying I'm out of paper at a time. That got a bit repetitive. I found myself turning to that and not being able to say anything else. So I've drawn away from that. But it was always natural for me to get it and throw it. Um, and that was something that I guess I have been, been able to get rid of. But it is the one thing that people will, will see me very few times. It doesn't happen very often. But when people do see me out and do recognize me, they'll say, hey, you're the paper guy. And so uh, it was something I didn't really ask for, but, but it just kind of happens by, by nature. And so it's not come on all you knuckleheads that Mike Wilbon does at the end of PTI, but it's, it's certainly, I guess, some kind of trademark. So at this point, uh, thank you to Tony Rielli and, and I hope people don't annoy it too much. I do recycle all those papers. So hopefully people aren't too upset. No, oh, very cool. I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to come on, uh, give us some insight into your career, uh, what you might want to do in the future and in, in esports and, and sports in general, because a lot of people think that sports, you know, down in the valley don't drive the needle. But when you cover sports, you realize how much that it actually does. Oh, this is one of the biggest examples. And I think just nationwide, you, you don't even have to localize it because right now people are looking for things to do. And the fact that the NFL draft drew the numbers it did, record shattering numbers in terms of viewership, just to see names being called, <clears throat> excuse me just goes to show how, how much people desperately need, or at least at the very least want sports to happen because it gives people a reason to talk, to collaborate, to have conversations, and just to sit back, enjoy, and forget about whatever else is going on. So great example with the NFL draft. And I really do think I've been preaching this since my first esports story is that the growth that you're seeing with esports, as much as parents don't want to admit it, it really is going to do something really, really positive for a lot of kids in the country. And it's going to give kids a lot of outlets. To, to continue to collaborate and do all those same things that we do with other sports. And I'm looking forward to seeing more and more school districts back that, especially here in the Valley. So, so kudos to McCown and ISD for doing that. And uh, I'm looking forward to covering more of that alongside 
other sports like football and your traditional, your traditional team sports. Okay, this is my last question, and, and I really do appreciate you coming on. What did you think yesterday when the, uh, the Patriots had a chance to take somebody and they took a third, or sorry, a Division II prospect? Yeah, that was what, in the second or third round? They yeah. The had never even heard of the university. At this point, you know, I think you question every kind of decision that a Cowboys or a Texans GM makes or a Cowboys or Texans coach if you're Bill O'Brien. And you kind of have this sense of hesitancy with anything they do. And I actually just put out my Cowboys uh, draft grade. I'll be putting out the Texans one later this evening. And everything I had, I just couldn't give a solid A plus because I'm just questioning everything. But when Bill Belichick's name's on that list and on that decision, it's harder to question that decision. So with that kind of pick, you almost think, oh, if Bill Belichick picked that, then this has to be something that that we didn't see, that we missed, and that it's just going to come back and be amazing despite the fact that he doesn't have Tom Brady anymore. You still associate the Patriots with just getting by on something that nobody else would have seen. So if it was any other team, I would have definitely blown it off or just questioned every pick like I did Jalen Hurts in the second round of the Eagles um, or third round. And But with Bill Belichick and the Patriots, I'm, I'm genuinely nervous to see how this turns out for them because, I mean, who was it that – the, the Bears drafted a Division II Another, in the second round. Yeah, yeah, they have like 11 tight ends on, on their yeah, roster. Yeah, like 11 now. Like that guy, a lot of people were like, oh, he's got the physical attributes and he, and he can do these type of things on the field against any kind of competition despite the fact that he was playing against scrubs, relatively mm-hmm. speaking. Yeah. The Patriots uh, make a decision and everyone's like, this guy's got the hidden talent and, and there's a possibility he becomes a real player. So you just don't know. But, but with Bill Pelichek, you really don't know. <laughs> Well, we'll be waiting for those uh, for that uh, that grading uh, of the the Cowboys is, is coming yeah, up today. Yeah, so the Cowboys is up right now on Valley Central and uh, and Houston's to come. I already have Houston's uh, individual analysis on each player, and they only have five picks. So do what you can with that, and uh, and their overall draft grade will be coming with uh, with Bill Bryan, Bill O'Brien on the hot seat. So plenty of content. Okay, I I can't stop this interview without asking you what was your grade on their free agency with what they did with uh, the trades? Uh, well, free agency is a completely different conversation than, uh, than draft, that's for sure. And, and I just want to tell you, I've got all the time in the world, so, so feel free to continue talking. But, um, but when it came down to the free agency move, again, I didn't mind getting rid of DeAndre Hopkins as much as Texans fans will hate me for saying that. Because from a price tag standpoint and the formula you've seen teams win Super Bowls with, you don't need that all-star high-paid wide receiver to do it. You, you can make the argument for Michael Thomas in New Orleans, but even they haven't won anything yet. Julio Jones, we saw how that ended up for a guy, but, you know, Patriots fans mm-hmm. will continue to remind, remind them for ages. Really, that Travis Kelsey last year was the dominating factor for, for the Chiefs outside of Pat Mahomes, but Pat Mahomes was already on a discount, and you don't have to pay a tight end, at least now, as much as you do a wide receiver. So the formula doesn't fit. So you get rid of DeAndre Hopkins. Now, where it turns for the Texans – is what they got in return. And this is where I think all Texans fans will agree with me is David Johnson as a running back is injury prone, may have his years behind him. Three years ago, he was a fantasy dynamo, just absolute monster, but injuries have derailed that. And so you're not really getting that back from DeAndre Hopkins. And then from a pick standpoint, I think the best thing you got was a a fourth rounder. I mean, that's it hurts. Or a second rounder, I, I just don't understand how you don't get a first round pick for Jadavian Clowney or DeAndre Hopkins, which just tells me that Bill O'Brien was was dealing relationships and not business. So that, that worries me. I won't give it a specific grade, but it's it's not pretty. It's definitely worse than the draft grade I gave him because I think they did much better in the draft. Well, there you have it. I mean, that was that was informative, quick, and you know, you dropped the hammer there. That was that was really good. Yeah, a little, a little too passionate. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll be uh, critical for both the Cowboys and the Texans, but it's a lot harder to be less critical to the Texans as of late, given the, some of the decisions Bill O'Brien's made. But, but who knows? He's trying to do the Patriots formula, so maybe we should start thinking about him in a different light, but we got to see some results first. Well, there you have it. Uh, you got to have to check out his, uh, your, your grade for Dallas and the Texans. And, and um, man, I, I want to – when pro sports comes back or if we do like a pro sports segment, I'd love to have you come back. Hey, anything, anything at all. I'm mean, esports, any kind of talk, Valley athletes. I'd love to talk. Uh, Jake, you've always been awesome. So 
looking forward to uh, to continuing our conversations and maybe getting a Fortnite game here or there and, uh, and maybe meeting up on the sticks. But uh, But no, always happy to help and always happy to have a conversation. Thank you so much.